Welcome to the Naughty Child Podcast with me, Richard. And me, Polly. I'm the dad. And I'm the daughter. I did everything before I leave. I need to find that bag on my coins. Alex Hartley took us off air in Brighton earlier this year. I'm a huge fan of Pepper. We thought we were really funny. So Bobby, I'm doing a <laughs> podcast, man. Come on. <laughs> well, my dog is now called Jimmy Anderson. Oh, well, Manchester Originals aren't through to the Eliminator, so I've got to change that to you. Do you cook French food? Like, do you cook frog legs and snails? <laughs> oh, I just lock myself in a procedure room. That Sophie Eccleston's the worst. It's like having a child with you when she's on tour. I don't know whether it shows something about me or whether it just shows something a little bit stupid. We've been on holiday this week, Polly. Well, we're still on holiday. We're still on holiday in the beautiful northeast mm-hmm. in Northumberland, which has been so nice. It's just so good to get out mm-hmm. of Birmingham somewhere <laughs> so full stop. <laughs> so totally different, mm-hmm. where it's proper big sky, mm. big sea, big beach, everything. It's just wonderful. I know. I really do appreciate just being able to walk down the road and you're at the beach. Probably the most beautiful beach in the world. With no people. With no people. Today was the first day I actually bumped into other people walking to the beach. And I was like, that's kind of... So we'd like to tell you where the beach is, but we'll spoil it by telling people. Yeah, so we have to keep it a secret. It's a top secret location. (laughs) Um, To be fair, you could probably guess it by where we've been. But anyway, it's still top secret. Um, So there hasn't been tons of women's cricket to talk about. Obviously, fair break's going on. Um, we haven't been able to follow that very closely. Um, there's been a couple of warm-up games. Sunrisers won another warm-up game against the Blaze. Yeah, but warm-up games don't count, do they? That's the thing. Exactly, that's the thing, because people play with 12 players, or they'll... Yeah, it means nothing. The, re- the real talking will be the first game of the season where I think they play Vipers. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know... Yeah, they win that. Then, then we can actually say something. Oh. Um, I will just say we haven't got the microphone today because I didn't bother bringing it. So if the audio is bad, then deal with it. Well, if the audio is better, then we'll just <laughs> get rid of the microphone. <laughs> yeah, it's 35 quid down the drain. <laughs> I don't even know how much it was in the end. But um, anyway, uh, yeah, as we said, there's not tons of women's cricket. So we've decided to just have a bit of a chat. We've asked some questions. We've got some great questions in. Um, so should we, should we just start with that? Yeah, let's go for it. So the first one um, on Instagram from Lucy was, when did you start the podcast? Um, um, well, if you look at our thing, you can see it. Um, but it was back in December 2021, I think. 2020. I thought we started in January. January. Did I say December? January 2021. January 2021, <laughs> yeah. So three and a bit Definitely years. Not Sorry, December. two and a bit years ago. Yeah. Um, so we started then. But women's cricket episodes consistently started in the July, when the 100 was on. Yes, so originally it wasn't really about women's cricket. Mm -hmm. And it it came from a conversation we had during that January lockdown Mm -hmm. at the beginning of 2021, where Polly, uh, you were just preparing to do GCSEs at the time, Mm -hmm. and we were talking about what you want to do in the future, and you said media. And I said, well, maybe you need to be thinking about what you're producing now for when you're applying for stuff in a couple of years' time for university. And out of that came the idea Mm -hmm. of doing a podcast where really we talked about my life growing up in the 1970s mm. and your life growing up in the noughties. Which you is... can only talk about that for so long. <laughs> what we found out is that after one series, we were running short of yeah. uh, things to talk about. After two series, we were definitely running things out of things to talk yeah. about. And um, uh, But then within that, Polly started contacting people, so contacted Kate Cross, Mm. and got her to come on the pod, contacted Alex Hartley. Which the more I think about it is a little bit mad, but anyway. I mean, I think we've done about three podcasts yeah. when when you contacted yeah. her. Um, but they agreed. And so that really helped us to make the decision, or mm. Polly really made the decision, to steer it towards women's cricket. And then yeah. with the 100 stuff. Well, yeah, I was like, well, we need to do the 100. Um, and so we just haven't stopped talking about women's cricket since. Yeah, it's changed the entire trajectory of my life. <laughs> so... Um, Thanks, the hundred. Um, the next question we have from Erling, not cricket related, uh, but inspired by Kate and Alex. How are you? Hope it is going well with exams slash work. So how are you? 
Well, it's a good week to ask. Yeah, I, I was going to say, this is probably like the uh, best point to ask us. Yeah, so um, I uh, had two weeks on holiday, so um, which really, really helps. Mm. So I'm a teacher. Um, so as soon as we get back in uh, on Monday, so we're recording this on Thursday night. So already my mind's mm. you know, starting to skip forward a little bit to Monday. Yeah. And uh, lots and lots of busy, busy, busy things mm. to do. Uh, but having this break has been really, really helpful just to recharge and um, get into that back into that mm. routine of, you know, I, I sort of get up about five, go to work for about seven, work through till about six. So it's it's a really it's really full on. Mm. It's really, really full on. Um, but the great thing is that you get these breaks in between where you can yeah. just sort of recharge. Yeah. And of course, obviously, I've got exams, but you have to then you have to get a cohort of year 11 through GCSEs. So that's also very busy. Yes, yes, indeed. Now you've got A levels coming up. And yeah. I don't want to say anything, Paul, except um, the whole of the rest of your life really depends on doing yeah, well on cheers, this. Cheers. Yeah. Um, to be honest, like I am kind of stressed about them, but like I think that's very internal stress rather than external. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, it's been a well, it's been a short two years, but it's been a long two years at the same time. Um, and if anyone actually has listened to the podcast for the entirety of my levels you know I started off doing French I actually had a nightmare the other night that I was still doing A-level French um I dropped that swapped to media very good decision um but I still also have history and politics which are quite full-on so even though we've been on holiday I've had to do a bit of work um but I think this part is it'll be the most intense couple of weeks because once I'm back at school um before study leave it will be full on. Um, but in terms of I finished all the courses, so there's no nothing new. I kind of, well, some stuff is kind of new that I need to learn. But in terms of we finished the courses, there's going to be nothing else sprung upon me. I had coursework for history and media, which I've handed in. Um, so that's all out of the way. So that's kind of the, the tough work that's gone on whilst learning the content. Um, yeah. So now it's just kind of, yeah, preparing for the exam. Um, and essentially, in two months' time, mm. it will be all over. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the end is in sight. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, once you get to that point, you, if you know that you've done as, as much mm -hmm. work as you can and it comes to an end, well, that's it. You've just got to yeah. uh, start the summer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and two days after it finishes, the test match starts. No, not two. How many? It's like six. Oh, I okay. finished on the 16th. Oh, okay. Brilliant. Um, so it's actually not too bad. It is about two months away. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, the next couple of months are quite intense. Um, and it's just balancing everything up and also just not getting too stressed. Um, see, I think about to GCSEs and I, I don't know how I did it really. Like I was, I was chill, <laughs> but I did well. So I need to take some inspiration from my 16 year old self. I mean, I, again, we have listeners all over the world. A-levels in, in the UK are, well, it actually is in England and Wales. Mm -hmm they they're very narrow so you just pick three subjects mm. and you do those quite intensely that's the thing people think you do three subjects it's going to be easy but it's, it's not, they're like in depth i think it's the hardest thing you do yeah in, this in, is what everyone's in saying your whole education me. system so um you're doing well and not only two months to go exactly um over to twitter for some questions so the first one um from cricket is simple is next england skipper after night and we've spoken a little about a little bit about this before um because it kind of cropped up over the summer when um heather was injured and nat summer brunt took over for a while then amy jones but kind of neither of them are natural successes because of the fact that they're the same age um so it's looking to kind of the next generation or just younger than heather i think that's a really difficult one because mm. there isn't a, a a succession plan there no clearly um, I think what we learned when Nat Siver Brunt was captain for the Commonwealth Games is that I don't think it's a role that suits her. No. Um, and it was, she found it really tough. Yeah. Um, so, in fact, she captained the 100 as well, didn't she? But actually handed it mm. over to Naomi Dutani. Was it halfway through? Who? Was it? Who was it that she handed it when, over to in, in the 100? Nat Siver? Yes. Uh, oh, 
It was, it was Trent Rocket, so it wasn't named Yusani. Who was it? Oh, I'm going to kick myself. Oh, Elise Filani. Yes. Elise Filani, that's yeah, it. I yeah, I knew Tani Filani. That's the one. <laughs> 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 Completely different players, but yeah, valid. <laughs> Similar ratio names. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I I think that's... It's not Nasiba. Yeah. It's not Amy Jones. No. So you're looking then at either someone with experience who can be interim mm. or you're looking for a completely new generation. The other thing you have to look at is who can captain in all three formats. This is the... And I think actually there are very, very few players as time goes on mm. who will be suited to all three formats. So Kate Cross yeah. would be a decent captain. But she didn't play T20. So. But she didn't play t- well, mm. she, well, she she's can, in the squad, but, but she never can, gets picked. Yeah. Um, clearly, Grace Scrivens mm. is going to be a really good option going forward. Yeah. Whether she's the person for after mm. Heather Knight, though. Yeah. Because think about it, she's 19 now. Say, thinking a couple of years down the line, do you want, like, a 22-year-old captaining? If she's, or, if she's brilliant, then yeah. Then yeah. But... Um, where is she going to get the experience yeah. in the meantime? Because she's not captaining for some risers. Nope. And she won't captain in the 100. Nope. And so you don't want to just throw someone in at the deep end. She did captain the under 19. Yeah. Brilliantly. Mm. Um, so I guess if I was some head honcho at the ECB, mm. I'd be looking for ways of giving her captaincy yeah. experience. Yeah. Um, but But we'll see. Yeah, hey. it's, it's a difficult question because then I suppose you look at the players who are kind of 22 to 25 at the moment. I think of someone like Charlie Dean, Charlie Dean who yeah. did Captain London Spirit last year. Yeah. Um, obviously, that wasn't like the plan as such for her to, to do that. It was injury replacement sort of situation. Um, but I think actually with a couple of years experience, I think she could do a good job. But again, where's she going to get that experience from? Because... Um, at Vipers, George Adams, the captain, right, very solidified there. Um, so it it is an interesting one because you've got to get a balance of who's got experience captaining, then who's also a good enough player to be on that team sheet every time. I mean, you say George Adams. Well, there's an interesting thought, isn't it? Do you yeah. bring someone in with loads of captaincy mm-hmm. experience, but maybe hasn't played international cricket before? But then is she a successor really to Heather Knight? I think there's probably two years age difference two or three I could be wrong but I again because for me she falls in that age bracket of like Amy Jones and that's of a brunt um and so it isn't doesn't feel like someone who'd be part of a succession plan but again I don't know it's a very very interesting question though and then it also brings up the idea of do you build a team around a captain or build a what's it the other way around or do you pick like, your best 11 yeah and yeah then and then decide the captain. Captain. yeah um, I, I think it'll. I can't see there being one captain in three formats. I just think that, that the amount of players that actually can and will play three formats mm. further reduces the field yeah. down. So, do you think it would ha- you'd have a T20 captain and then a Test and ODI rather than like a White Ball Red Ball? Yeah. Because yeah. to be fair, having a Red Ball captain at this point would be kind of pointless because <laughs> you've got like one Test a year. Yeah, but that creates its own issues as well, yeah. doesn't it? When people switch from one mm. format to the other, and you know, the question of who's in charge, and that's the thing because it's also like we're not at the point in the women's game as we are with the men's when actually the T Twenty team to the Test team are probably quite similar in terms of your core players. There might be two or three players that will change, but it's not that you've got completely different teams. So then, would the Test captain want to be captained? in the T20s by someone else and different power dynamics, all that sort of thing. Gets and you look messy. across the regions as well and who's captaining. So yeah. you've got Eve Jones, George Adams. Ellie uh, Threlkeld. Ellie Threlkeld. Holly Armitage. Yeah. Sophie Luff. Yeah. Uh, Kelly Castle. Mm-hmm. And Catherine Bryce, do it for the Blaze. Pretty sure, yeah, Catherine Bryce. Well, obviously Scotland, so. It's... Yeah. So out of those... You'd say in terms of age bracket, mm. Ellie Threlkeld yeah. um, is is the one mm-hmm. that could potentially become yeah. an England captain. But she's not first choice wicketkeeper. No. Well, this is the thing, because then we've spoken about 
who's going to be the next keeper for England. And it's kind of, at the moment, seems to be Beth Heath or Eddie Threlkeld. But then Beth Heath isn't g- probably going to get much chance to be a keeper because she's stayed at Northern Diamonds and they've got Lauren Wilford Hill there. Ellie Threlkeld, on the other hand, is playing every game for Thunder, captaining them. So her wicket keeps improving. Her batting improved massively last season. And she's getting captaincy experience. So there's another kind of person in the mix. So we'll see, but it's, it's a very, very good question. My my thought is that, that after Heather Knight decides mm-hmm. to go, we don't know when that's going to happen. It could yeah. be in a year's time. It could be in two mm-hmm. or three or four years' time. Yeah. There'll probably be an interim period. Yeah. Before potentially Grace Scrivens mm-hmm. takes it all. On. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I wonder if this is something John Lewis will look at. Um, because obviously when you get a new coach, mm-hmm. you know, he he might have different ideas. Um, so yeah, we'll see. Um, the next question from Jamie is castles with cricket grounds. So for context, we posted a couple of pictures today because we went to Bamborough Castle uh, for historical reasons. Um, but there happens to be a beautiful cricket ground just outside of it. Um, and we walked to the cricket ground and from the boundary, uh, you can just see Bamber Castle in the background towering over it. And I just thought, how good would it be to just walk out to the middle and back there? In fact, the wall of the castle sort of really sort of adjoins the mm, ground, doesn't yeah. it? And it's absolutely beautiful. It looks stunning. It's just an amazing part of the world. Yeah, so Bamber and Northumberland. Mm-hmm go there it's just the best place in the world yeah so jamie mentions porchester castle uh in hampshire so i actually googled a photo Mm -hmm. and you've got the castle walls like kind of surrounding the ground and over the walls there's a sea with yachts it's beautiful so it's inside the castle walls i think so yeah so if you get besieged by Vikings yeah. during the game that's quite handy isn't it yeah yeah (laughs) or if the war of the roses breaks out again well well, you never know. <laughs> um, but it's fine. Kate Cross has solved the War of the Roses, so it's yes. all good. Um, her and Henry VII, which yeah. is a joke that went over on everyone's head, but it's fine. I think it's a brilliant joke. Thank you, thank you. Um, but I was looking at other grounds. So um, Wormsley, great example. Sparks is home ground. Yeah, yeah, in the um, Midlands, isn't in it? In the Midlands. Is it, is it you... Central Birmingham? Yeah, Central Birmingham. Boring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautiful ground. Um, Arundel or Arundel. Everyone's Arundel, in the different. Yeah. Arundel, yeah. yeah. Um, I heard that's very nice. There was a fancy private school somewhere with a nice view. I was like, cool. Um, I'm not going to play there. Um, but, I mean, England has some great grounds. Mm. Um, and I think when you've got these little villages... So, I can't remember where it was that I had that game. It was the day of the Men's Euros final. Oh, yeah. And that was stunning. It was on, like, this really nice... Um, it was in a stately home, wasn't yeah. it? The grounds of a stately home. Yeah. In, right on the Worcestershire Warwickshire border. Yeah. Um, I can't remember I can't who remember. we're playing. I drove with. you there. I can't yeah. remember what it was called. Um, but that was really nice. Just remember that the game went on forever and ever and it ever. It was 33 overs. <laughs> and and each, and I was looking at my watch thinking, we're going to yeah. miss this football game. Well, yeah, we were getting annoyed on the pitch. We are like, can we put it down? But the other <laughs> team really didn't care. So, um, but yeah, we love pretty cricket grounds. Mm-hmm. So I was very glad that we could go see um, Bamber today. Um, the next question from Raf is, uh, what will the scoreline be in the Ashes? We've had another question about the Ashes. Um, and who will the top run scorer be? Well, it's worth saying, actually, on Tuesday, we're going to Birmingham Town Hall to go and yes, uh, we are. see Test Match Special Live mm-hmm. and with Glenn McGrath, who's already yeah. made his yeah, yeah. biannual prediction mm-hmm. for the yeah. Ashes that it's going to be 5 to Australia. Yeah. Uh, now, of course, the women's... Ashes runs on a mm-hmm. different format from that. Yeah. So I think is it sixteen points you can get? something like that. Um, I so think let's make four, is it forty. Is it two points for for each ODI or T twenty and eight points eight for the test? test or is it well, let's not do it based on numbers. Let's just do it based on the games. I mean, so, Australia are going to win. Yeah, Australia are going to win. <laughs> that's that's plain and simple. I'm not going to be out here being like, yeah, England are going to thrash the Aussies. No, no chance. Because you know what? Last time I did this in this episode with um, our guest. Well, yeah, I'm not going to talk about that. So, um, no wild predictions. I think. Having the test match first, I think, is significant. Yeah. If we can win the test match, which we very nearly did in Australia, mm. then that does give us hope. Yeah. 
And also, add another day, someone's going to win it. Like, I can't see it being a draw unless there's three days of rain. Yeah. Well, there'll be three days of rain now. <laughs> but um, there, there should be a result. And I think, given how close England managed to get, I know there's been personnel changes, but given how close England got last time, I think there's a potential. If England can win the Test match, then I think it will be close. But I think mm-hmm. Australia will still win overall. Because yeah. you think about the number of ODIs and T20 games we've played against Australia yeah. since we last won one. Mm. I, I mean, I I don't know. I mean, someone can dig out mm. when we actually last beat Australia yeah. in any format, but it's a very long time. Yeah. Though. And this is the thing. Australia have just dominated in the last, well, for ages, but particularly the last 12 months. They've won two World Cups and they won a Commonwealth Games gold. And at no point did I think, oh, someone's going to really beat them. Like, other than India, I think at some points I think, okay, India could do this. But they've just looked unbeatable. And we've said before, they can win from anywhere. So I think ODIs, they can, we've seen them score tons of runs. Yes, England can, but they solely rely on that sort of run most of the time. Um, Whereas Australia have got tons of people putting their hand up. They're bringing through young players like Phoebe Litchfield, who I just think are going to destroy England at points. Um, we saw how England played, played against India in the ODIs in September. That, for me, was a bit of a concern. Um, so, yeah, I I don't see England... I, th- I could think England could win maybe an ODI in a T20, possibly the Test match, but I think it is going to be kind of a, an Aussie show as normal. Yeah, and because Australia hold the Ashes, then mm. if it's a tie... If it's a tie, then they still retain it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that'd be great if it's close. Like, yeah. And, and we push them close. You know, mm-hmm. Even if we end up losing most of the games, yeah. if they're close games, that's, that that's gives us thing. a bit more hope, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I think Raf asked as well about who's going to be the top run scorers. Yeah. And again, you just look at the whole Australian top <laughs> five. Yeah. And... You know, so you can think, well, Alyssa Healy mm. is going to be there or thereabouts. But Meg Lanning. <laughs> but if not her, or as well yeah. as her. Uh, Beth Mooney. <laughs> Beth Mooney, at least yeah, Perry. Exactly. Mm. The, for them all to fail every game is just very unlikely. Very unlikely, yeah. And then what we've seen with Australia is when they have failed, mm. Tali McGrath has stepped yeah, up. Yeah, Jess Johnson. Yeah, you know, the batter number eight, nine, ten yeah. can step up and hit a quick 50 and just yeah. change everything. <laughs> Megan shoot. Yeah. Um, yeah. And again, those are all things that England don't have. Yeah. So really, England got to look for not just Nat Siver Brunt, mm. but you've got to be looking for Tammy Beaumont, yeah. for Alice Capsey. Emma Lamb. Emma Lamb, Amy Jones. All these people to yeah. be stepping up every game mm. and and you know doing amazing amazing mm. things and you're looking for Australia also to have some bad days yeah. out there and I think that's just not going to happen. Yeah, exactly. Um, this question actually comes quite nicely after this from Faith, who says, "Why do you think England struggle so much to put in an all-round batting slash bowling performance? It's such a seesaw." I barely remember last the last time everything really clicked in an ODI, which I agree with. Um, I think the India series was such proof of that, that England kind of just got a bit battered. And there hasn't been that all-round good performance. There's either been quite good batting or quite good bowling. Most of the time, it's the batting that's let England down. Yes. I, I mean, thinking back to that infamous Lords game, oh. England should have won that easily. Yeah. I mean, India batted first mm-hmm. and got next to nothing. Yeah. So it was it was a very, very easy mm. win on a plate for England. And how yeah. we threw it away, how we got in a position where we were nine mm-hmm. wickets down, it was absolutely ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And I think what we, uh, yeah, we're looking for much more consistency in batting, yeah. aren't we? That's, that's what's going to make a difference. Yeah, this is the thing. And I think England have had a lot of change in personnel, which I think doesn't help with, consistency so of course you had Anya Shrubsall retiring Mm -hmm. Catherine Silverbrunt half retiring um playing some games over the summer having Heather injured Nat Silverbrunt missing the ODI series against India I feel like we can kind of ignore the West Indies series a bit because to me that doesn't really say much about the team because 
it was very poor from West mm. Indies. Um, so, yeah. Um, so I think there has been inconsistency in who's been playing. Um, but at the same time, that you know, as we said with Australia, if one person fails, other people step up, and that's not really happening with England. Mm. Um, and so it it's important that there are more consistent performances at the top of the order from... You think about the T20s um, with like Danny Wyatt and um, Sphere Dunkley. Then also in the ODIs. I mean, I noticed this with the ODIs that the openers have, I mean, to, even with the T20s, the openers have changed quite a bit. And I think that perhaps has unsettled things. And I guess with John Lewis coming in, he'll want to mix things up even more. I'll be interested to see his approach in the Ashes with what order he goes with. Um, I think, yeah, there's just been a lot of chop and change, which... I get every team has it at different points, but I think that hasn't helped with consistency and putting in these quality all round performances. So I was thinking about the test match. Yeah. Do you think Izzy Wong mm -hmm. and Alice Capsey both must play? Well, we had this conversation um, the other day about who's our 11 for the test. Um, I said, put Alice Capsey in. I said mm. the only way I wouldn't put her in is if I put ADR in, for example. Um, but then it depends, okay, do you play a spinner in Earth Capsi, like part-time spinner, or a seamer in ADR? Um, for me, is he one? Yes. I think she was quite significant in the test against South Africa mm -hmm. um, in terms of being impactful. Um, on the day I went, which I think was day three, um, there'd been a bit of rain, but she came on, took two wickets, um, so I, I think you've got to play her. Um, but then we talk about this with Alice Capsi. Well, if you leave her out, how on earth do you justify that? Mm. Um, because, well, she's never played she's never played red ball cricket. So you don't know. She can't say she's bad at it. Um, so It's a really yeah. strange one, isn't it? Um, I, I think with Izzy Wong, I mean, she's she's got star quality. Yeah. And you put her into tough situations mm. and... Put under the spotlight and yeah. she thrives. rises yeah. to the occasion she she thrives but also she can be incredibly expensive mm. you know so those full tosses that get her wickets yeah. also get a hit for six exactly as well and also i feel like against australia they just punish anything so so i think player but she needs to be used very very wisely yeah um, and, and if she starts being expensive, she, I think she just yeah. needs to be taken off. Yeah. Um, but, you know, she's brilliant in the field. Mm. She's a brilliant person to have as part yeah. of the group. Um, but, you know, I think someone like Emma Arlott, who's been yeah. in the last two test squads <laughs> but not played, yeah. again, is worth looking mm. at. You know, the complete opposite of Izzy Wong. Yeah. You know, is but is totally consistent. Yeah. And I think for red ball cricket would be, would be mm. really, really, really good. Yeah. Uh, but again, the moment you say that, it's like, well, who are you going to not play? Yeah, like you're not going to play Kate Cross, yeah, or um, Lauren Bell, or Lauren Bell, yeah. So yeah. there are, yeah. I'm I'm glad we don't have to pick the team. I know. I'm, I'm glad we just get to speculate and <laughs> chat about it instead. Um, the final question we have is kind of um, two parts. So my main interest will be the Ashes. Um, although I want Heather and the girls to smash the Aussies, I feel we will be um, a poor second. Yeah agreed <laughs> um i feel our domestic game is three to five years behind the aussies in terms of quality and depth um any thoughts to cheer me up um do you know how much uh i can cheer you up on that one i would agree that i think our domestic system is behind but i i mean there's not much you can do about that now i think it's just about kind of pushing forward it's interesting i was listening to um listening to How's Out the Cricket Podcast, good friend Lily, um, who was chatting to Sophie Luff. And Sophie Luff has just spent the winter in Australia training with New South Wales. And they've just got a brand new facility called, I think it's like called like Cricket Central in Sydney. And it is massive. There are like something like 70 uh, nets and there's a gym, there's cricket pitches, all this stuff. Um, and the women will get access to that. Um, there is no facility like that in England. Um, of course, Australia have been professional for longer. Uh, I would say the WNCL, the quality of that has gone up massively. 
um, the WBBL is established and has been running for a long time. They don't have another T20 competition. Um, so, yeah, I think they are miles ahead of England. But at the same time, we can't just accept that and be like, oh, well, the miles ahead, so blah, blah, blah. Um, it's looking, okay, well, how can the English system improve? If there is some hope to be given mm -hmm. to in this area, I think it's looking at the under-19s. Yeah. Because England under-19s defeated Australia <laughs> under-19s. Yeah. Albeit by, by a very close margin. Yeah. But they did. And actually in that competition, looked mm -hmm. like the better side mm -hmm. across all the games. So we do have a crop of very promising young mm -hmm. players coming through. Yeah. Now, what we need to be doing is developing those young players mm -hmm. and giving them opportunities this season. Yeah. Um, because what we what we don't want is those Australia under nineteens to be developed much more quickly than ours. Yeah. And so two, three, four years down the line to be way ahead mm. of those players that played in the under nineteens. Yeah. So they need to be given opportunities. They need to be worked with and developed, mm -hmm. given professional contracts, yeah. all those things to make sure that we've got mm -hmm. this core of really good young players now coming through that maybe not this Ashes, but maybe the next mm. Ashes or even the one after that, yeah. you know, in four years' time, in eight years' time, they can actually be Ashes winners. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think about three or four of the under-19s team before they went to South Africa were professional, were, were just turned professional. Now I think it's the majority of them. Mm -hmm. Um which is really good to see um because yes although that you know they are very young um but they're in these professional environments and having access to facilities coaches all these things which players who are 10 years older than them uh, have never had until now um so to have that from such a young age coming through is only going to help and that's what the Aussies have um so if if we can also provide that that then that's really important. Um, but then also, I think things like with the increase of franchise cricket, players are having so many more opportunities mm. um, and actually get to face these other cricketers before they play international cricket, for some of them. Um, so, again, I think, of course, our domestic, season, um, domestic setup needs a bit of work, but that has to take time because I don't think you can kind of run before you can walk and because imagine if they went from no domestic contracts to a full team of professionals that's a massive step the way they're gradually doing it I think is is key and although it's frustrating because it does take a lot of time in the long term I think that's probably better mm -hmm. um but yeah I mean the Aussies are are just ahead and they've now just chucked a lot more money into <laughs> domestic women's cricket which is great I think that's an amazing thing but at the same time, we don't want Australia to continue to pull away from every other country and suddenly become or continue to be these giants within the women's game. I've got a question for you. OK. Which uncapped England players Ooh. are we going to be seeing making their debut this year? Oh, you should have given me time to think about Maybe not necessarily in the Ashes, but yeah, the Sri Lanka series. Lanka series. Afterwards. That's Can I throw in Grace Scrivens yeah. to start Yeah. With? I think Grace Grimms is a good shout. So I think members of that under-19 side mm -hmm. need to be given opportunities yeah. to be full international sooner mm -hmm. rather than later. Grace Grimms mm -hmm. being front of the queue. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of other players. I think uh, Danny Gibson is mm -hmm. quite a decent shout. Um, she is kind of a go big or go home sort of player. Mm -hmm. um, but I think actually an opportunity to play against Sri Lanka would be, would be really good. Um, if you had given me more time to think, I would have come well, up with Emily Arlott, someone we Emily mentioned Arlott, yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's that's a possible. And then as well, there's Australia bringing an A-side over as well. Yeah. So there'll be an opportunity potentially for fringe players mm. to be given the chance to play against Australia A. Eh? Yeah, so they're playing quite a few games, um, which, yeah, it'll be interesting to see who gets picked for that A-squad. Mm. Um because I think that would be quite exciting. I mean, it w there's been people we've been banging the drum for for a while, like Eve mm -hmm. Jones. Yeah. Is this her year to step up through the 
you know, through yeah. those A games yeah. and say, actually, yeah, I'm, I'm someone we're considering mm. a left-handed yeah. top order batter that could really mix things up against us. Well, I mean, I'll be really interested to see if anyone in that A side does get bought into the England side based on form, mm-hmm. um, especially if perhaps England are struggling and they need, okay, we need a, someone who's got a great strike rate. And mm-hmm. um, I don't know, Danny Gibson's strike rate is like over 200 or something. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, bring her in. Um, I don't know whether that will... I think it's more likely to happen over in England because the players will be more used to the conditions, but um, I don't know. I'm trying to think of other players off the top of my head who um, might get picked up. Um, It's difficult to see beyond who's already in that circle, isn't it? But I think it would be quite short-sighted only to just pick people within yeah, the circle. No, no, I, Again, I, I mean, that. we talked about ADR in the, in yeah. the past, Alex Davis and Richards, who I think is just the unluckiest mm. England player by a mile. Yeah. She's just, you know, she turns up to that test match, scores a century, <laughs> and then has not really been picked since. Yeah. No, that, and she got 50 in the ODI. Got 50 in the ODI. And then got <laughs> dropped in Canterbury at, yeah. at home, which is, um, yeah, no, no, I agree. Um, so we'll see. Um, in fact, um, yeah, we might do another podcast where we kind of go through in a bit more mm. detail who we think could get called up or that sort of thing. I think as well as the Rachel Hale Flint trophy goes along. That it becomes that. more clear who's who's found mm. form and stuff like that. Um, because also we'll get a bit of Rachel Hale Flint and we'll have the whole of the Charlotte Edwards Cup before the Ashes. Mm. Um, so we'll really be able to see who's found form in fifty over and twenty over. Um, the final thing, actually, a uh, bit of cricket news. Was about Vipers and their six-month professional contracts. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, so they've contracted six players mm-hmm. uh, for six months as professionals. So their entire squad will be professional, pretty much. Um, and we've talked about this in the past, haven't we, where you've got squads split. In the, yeah. the, your professionals get all trained together and then amateurs have got their own job mm. and then having to fit stuff in in the evenings yeah. and not feeling completely part of the team, mm. whereas this completely changes that. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. Viper's the only team that have done it. Um, clearly have chucked a lot of money at this. Like, whether that's come from Hampshire, I don't know. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a big deal. The only question I do have is about slight lack of security because, okay, yeah, you've got this full-time job for six months, but then what happens? So presumably there'll be more contracts. Um but I won't imagine all those six players could get them because that would be a, quite a big step up to contract six more people. You know, last year they gave out four more contracts, I mm. think, um, but six more is a lot more. So whether they give out three and players have to essentially like fight for them, um, I don't know. But I would imagine for some people that's been quite a big decision to mm. say, OK, I'm going to quit my job so I can play as a professional for six months and then you you have to make a decision. Huge, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So it's quite difficult, but that's typical Vipers. Mm. Um, but again, it, it's more professionalism, which is which is good to see. Very good. Is it time to introduce our guest? It is. Speaking of the new season, um, someone who's going to turn sunrises around, um, <laughs> who actually played her first game today, uh, mm. Saskia Hawley, who is um, obviously Australian, um, plays for Scotland, um, featured on Disney, um, yes. Now, can we put the link up for? We people? will. Oh, I'm going to put that link everywhere <sighs> because I think it is one of the greatest videos on YouTube. So Disney Channel did when Saskia was about 11, 10 or 11, 11 years, yeah. years old. She got to meet Elise Perry and do just the cheesiest <laughs> uh, thing you'll ever see. Mm-hmm. But um, so we'll put that link up for you. Yeah. So we spoke to Saskia all about kind of her cricket journey um, and, of course, the decision to come and play for Sunrisers. So enjoy our chat with Saskia. So you said you're in the UK at the moment. Um, have you met up with Sunrisers yet? And like, where are you with cricket and stuff? Yeah, so I arrived, it was two weeks, yeah, two weeks on Monday um, ago um, on the 20th of March, um, as soon as the season was done at home um, in Sydney, got on a flight and came straight over, um, which was cool. Uh, obviously haven't been here for about 
nine months now. So um, it was good to be back and see some of the girls again. I've already, yeah, I've seen some of Sunrise's girls. I was out there training. I didn't actually train because I've got, unfortunately, I've got some time off at the moment, which is really nice because I've basically had two seasons on the, on like, as far as an Aussie season, a UK season, Aussie season, UK season. Um, so two years of not a heap of rest. Um, so it's been really nice to have some time to um, travel a little bit, went to Paris, um, which was really cool the other week, and then been to Wales as well. So done a little bit of travel, which has been really nice because last year I didn't have much um, opportunity to do stuff kind of outside of, of England, I guess. But no, it's been, it's been good. It's good to see some people that I obviously met last year and stuff. Yeah. Oh, but we love Paris. Mm. Uh, what a good choice. Yeah. Do you speak much French? Um, I spoke French up until um, year 10 at school. So I left school five years ago now. So, and that's and then that's two years from year 12. So I've literally seven years. No, my French wasn't very good. And um, we struggled a little bit there, actually, to be fair. Just kind of everything was French, no English. And it was very difficult to make out words because words looked right in English in a way, but they actually meant not what you thought um and their transport system is is awful in my opinion because i don't understand it if you can understand it'd be great but if you don't it's really really difficult because there's so many lines and and all this so but i was there for a chris brown concert so that was really cool to see chris brown as well while i was there so yeah that's good that sounds amazing you say you came yeah. over the uh, middle of march was it still snowing when you arrived in the uk because we had loads of snow in march didn't we uh no it wasn't snowing it's just it's the weather hasn't been great in london itself it's been very wet um we had a really good day i think yesterday it was blue yeah. sky the whole day which i was like this feels like home this is really nice but then today it's rain again so it's back to the weather knows that the cricket season officially starts tomorrow and so that's when the rain really starts coming down of course of course it's always the way but it was a really good summer last year so hopefully we get a little bit of the same this year be nice yeah, a lot of people have said it's, I think it's the rainiest March has been in a couple of years. And so it's just like... Oh, 40 don't... years. For, 40 for, years. 40 years. West is March. Yeah, well. Gosh. Yeah. So hopefully it will dry up before tomorrow because, yeah, not great. Um, But anyway, what's your cricket story and how did you first get into cricket? Uh, yeah, so I, I grew up on the North Shore um, in Sydney uh, with my mum and dad. Um, I was an only child, so... My dad was actually, I don't know if it's the same for you guys, but my dad was like my little brother, or like my older brother, I should say. Um, and he was just, a, he's just a child at heart. He's a child at heart. He loves his sport. Um, so me and him are really, really tight. So I kind of went around to his games and um, kind of just played around with the other kids and stuff because there was quite a few families around and stuff who were kind of kids with my age and stuff. So uh, we kind of just, yeah, mum and I went to his games and what we still do to this day as well. Um and then, yeah, it was kind of like, this is cool. And then dad was like, do you want to, like, we just kind of play backyard cricket like every kid I'm pretty sure does. Uh, we play backyard cricket all the time uh, for Christmas in particular, like with my cousins and stuff. Um, and then from there, dad was like, oh, why don't you try out for this kind of, we call it Sydney North at home. It's just kind of a small, um, for the public schools, um, when you're in primary, you can trial for that and make a representative side, I guess. Um, and dad was like, why don't you trial? And I was like, sure. So like, I, went, I went along because so I was like, cricket was cool and just kind of was like, well, yeah, give it a go. Um, and then I like bowled, I bowled pace, but I was I was in year five. So I was really small compared to year sixes. So I think girls, I don't know if it's the same in the UK, but in Oz, like year five and year six girl, they grow, like you grow like double your height. Like some girls just have their, they have their boom then. And I had not, not that I'm giant now, but I was, I was really small. So dad was like, why don't you just try your spin? And it wasn't spin. It was just loopy, get up there, get to the other end. Cause he was like, you're not as big as everyone else. And I was like, okay, this is fair. And then that was when I started spin bowling and made that side. So it was like, that was kind of where it all started um, for me with off spin, um, which I thank my dad for that. Um, for kind of just going, you know what, do that. Cause it was different. So um yeah, so I kind of did that, went through um, all of that sort of representative stuff, got into the, I was fortunate to get into the New South Wales pathway, um, went through that um, and then was fortunate enough in 2017 when I was 17 to get a breakers contract, so a New South Wales contract, which was really exciting. It was awesome. It was the first year that um, cricket was professional. So I was really lucky. I got into a really lucky era of getting my first contract and being paid. So um, really lucky with that. And then I've kind of from then was lost my contract for breakers one year. Um, best thing that ever happened to me, to be honest, in hindsight. Um, learned a lot about myself and how to actually 
I think earn money in my opinion is the way I describe it and um, had to work an RSL that I worked till 4am a lot of mornings so taught me how to yeah really really work hard like really work hard for money and um, and things like that started my own coaching business um, at home and just did a lot of stuff for myself in that year and um, ended up having an awesome grade season um, scoring a heap of runs and then got selected again for New South Wales to come back which I think is one of the first times they've ever had someone who's lost their New South Wales contract and got a New South Wales contract back so a lot say lose their New South Wales contract but then go to another state or look for other opportunities so um, and then all the Scotland stuff has kind of happened as well like it's been the last two years have been massive as far as myself just for everything really which has been really really cool but yeah that's kind of that's my story in a way it's kind of cool that's brilliant I mean it sounds like you just you found this hunger uh, from somewhere to to really really want to you know make something of cricket and that's what exactly what's happened yeah, I, I I did get to a point when um when I was out of form, I was in really bad form and and I wasn't enjoying cricket. I wasn't at all. Like I was hating it. It was just I was not I wasn't ungrateful for what I had because I was still had New South contract. I had all these opportunities, but I just didn't know. I couldn't find the enjoyment as much from it. Um, and then I kind I got kind of got asked from some people like, oh, do you want to be professional cricket? And I said, I actually don't know. Like I'm being honest with you. Like I don't know. I could I could have lied to them and gone, yeah, I do. But in my heart, I was like, no, I actually, I actually have no idea. Um, and then I was like, I kind of worked out that year losing contract and stuff that, yeah, you know what, I actually do want to get my contract back. I want to be, hung- I'm hungry for it. Um, so yeah, as you said, like it's definitely made me have a change of thinking and just be, I think, more composed and relaxed in just in a cricket sense, really. And just, and also a life sense, just, I feel a bit more together than before. <laughs> That's my biggest thing. I mean, thank you for sharing that that insight into your childhood. However, in researching this a little bit, we we had a little insight into your childhood from the Disney Channel as well. Oh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Tell yes, us was... all about the Disney Channel. Yeah, so I don't even know how mum and, like, obviously I was, I think, I, how old was I there? Maybe 10, 11? I was in primary school, I'm pretty sure. Or maybe, uh, yeah, primary school, end of primary school and somehow these people got in contact with us which was ironic because the other person who was going to be in the running for it to be their house I was actually really good mates with and then because we fortunately enough lived in a really uh, like a better suburb than her we got selected I was like (laughs) okay but then ironically I invited her to the like the last the last scene like the game scene and she didn't rock up and I was like okay she's just dirty that we got it but yeah that was cool so like Elise Perry was my idol growing up because I played soccer and and everything like that and I think she was a lot of people's idols she still is to this day um and yeah just kind of got the opportunity and then we were like oh whatever and then dad loves his role in it so um yeah I get like, it comes up in every single team like when I when I played for Scotland someone found it and went and just put it on the group chat and I was like no, I'm not gonna live this down ever it's not even my fault even as well like I didn't choose to have this but it was still cool and it was funny because all of the tips that Elise was giving me were for pace bowler and I was a spin bowler and I was like and they were the producers were kind of like hey this isn't for you to know I'm like yeah I know these skills how to catch a ball and stuff they're like it's for the audience and I was like okay but then mum mum and dad when we finished filming they're like oh it'll be on in like six months and we were like sweet mum and dad's just like like recording everything on Disney Channel to try and find it and then someone I think messaged mum and went it's on it's on this channel it's on Disney Channel now 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 go on it so then Eventually they got it and then mum put it on YouTube and then now it's there for the world to see. So it's great. But once, bit first, once, once people get over the initial fact of it, it's great because then I can just live my life. <laughs> Basically. Uh, I, I thought it was amazing. It was, um, yeah, it was, it kind of, it's one of those things where it's very much like of its time. So like, I can't imagine the the same thing being done now. I don't know. It was no, quite, <laughs> no, definitely yeah. not. It was of an era. It was a bit cheesy. Yeah. <laughs> correct very cheesy and ev- everyone asked me oh was it scripted I'm like yes I didn't say ev- everything they said for me to say and for her to say was scripted it wasn't like think about what you want to say it was all scripted that's why it's so cheesy um but no it was an experience and it was fun but yeah brilliant so um New South Wales um you've been um playing for them uh this season tell me about the season uh, playing for New South Wales yeah so it was a bit of a it was a bit of an everywhere season um, for us. So we, when we started the season, I 
had the opportunity to play to debut for Scotland. That was when I first debuted in September. Um, and I kind of my my coach Gav, bless his soul, he he's an awesome man, and he said to me, he said, no, I want you to have for the first time I've been given, I guess the freedom to go. Okay, I want to actually do do I pick the Scotland stuff or do I pick Breakers games? Because I knew I would miss New South Wales games by going and playing in Scotland. But he said, I'm not going to hold you back from that, which I thought was awesome because there was an opportunity there for me that if I wanted to take that, I could. And if I didn't, then I'd still be playing really high level cricket with New South Wales. Um, but I chose, because I wasn't sure if I would have played those games when I was away, I chose Scotland and that was really, I, I still stick by that decision today. So um, yeah, we started really well. Then I came home and played some games um, and then kind of went into the big bash season really good. Like as in, we were winning some games, we lost a couple, but won most of our games. And then the rest of the season, we kind of didn't perform very well. We had a lot of injuries around, um, unfortunately. Um, a lot of our pace bowlers broke down and, and we're out for extended periods of time, which didn't help us. But it also gave an opportunity for, I think there was 20 odd girls who played the whole season. And for us to have like 20 odd girls is massive. Like a lot of teams were only using 16 players the whole season. Um, which was a good thing and a bad thing at the same time. I guess we're trying to, te we're testing our depth and giving girls opportunity. Um, but also maybe their opportunity is only coming because some players are out. So it's a bit of a win-win in a way, but it was really cool to see players debut and stuff. And then we finished the season really well um, by beating ACT in the last two games, which was awesome just to cap off our season and go, you know what, this we can use this for next year. Um so, yeah, I think it's really exciting times ahead for the New South Wales group because we're really young, really, really young compared to some other groups. So for us to kind of pull through in those last games was really impressive. Um, but, no, it's been it's been really good being back in the New South Wales environment and under Gab and stuff. Really good. And one of those standout young players for New South Wales is is Phoebe Litchfield. And I, I yeah. get the feeling we're going to get to see a lot more of her in this Ashes summer as well. Yeah, Lich is awesome. So it actually just got announced, I think today, I don't know, it's maybe today Aussie time that she got a CA, that she got a Cricket Australia contract, which she deserves so much. She's worked so hard um, the last, I want to say two years in particular, like the big bash and stuff like for Thunder, like she really took control this year and stuff like that. Um, so it's been really exciting to see the way that she's developed and she's a really good kid, really, really good kid who has so much talent that she doesn't realise it herself um and I can't wait till the day that she actually realizes oh you know what I'm a really good cricketer and I'm like bitch I know I've been telling you this for the last three years five years like she's an extraordinary player and she brings a little bit of something that a lot of players unfortunately can't bring to the game like she's an extraordinary player who can just reverse sweep for the first ball and and things like that that a lot of players even in the Aussie setup now wish they could do from ball one like I just think once she starts to I, I still don't think we've even seen the best of her. I still think she still has so much that she's just going to really, really smash it and, and, and travel around the world playing the game that she loves, which would be really cool. Yeah, I mean, it's less so exciting for us as England fans because I'm scared of what she's going to do to our bowlers, but it, it's all right. Um, yeah, no, she's she's an incredible upcoming talent. No, definitely. Um, so talk to us about your Scotland debut and how the whole Scotland thing came about. Uh, yeah, so my mum was born in Edinburgh, so she moved over to Oz in about 25 years ago, so she's been in Australia most of her life now, she would say, um, and she's she's well and truly Aussie, but then also love, would love to travel. I, I wish she could come over when I debuted. Um, unfortunately, they couldn't. It was just a bit too busy and stuff, but yeah, my my old manager, he was just talking about opportunities and stuff. And I lost my contract and was like, well, what can we, what avenues can we go down? And then mum just threw the idea out and went, Oh, I mean, I'm Scottish. You can play for Scotland. And then he was like, hold on. Okay. Let's actually go with this. So then kind of moved with it. Um, and then it ended up being talking to the coach and stuff. And then I was supposed to, it's a funny story. I was supposed to go to Malaysia um, in January, 2022. And that was when COVID was pretty full on and stuff at home. And I mean, around the world to be fair, but at home it was pretty full on at the time. And um, I was like, sweet, I'm going to Malaysia in to play their um, European qualifiers. I was like, sweet, this would be really cool. Uh, then dad got COVID. And so then I was like, hey, dad, I'm going to go to my room and I'm not going to leave because I don't want to catch COVID, whatever. Um, we did Christmas, like kind of semi-separately. We made sure that like he was away from mum and I and stuff. 
unfortunately I got COVID on the test that I needed to go over. So I had to do a test to travel at the time when it was obviously a bit stricter and I was positive. So I couldn't actually travel, which was really, was really annoying. And I wasn't very happy with dad, obviously. And, and he was like, it's okay. And I was like, no, 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 it's actually not okay right now. But we got over it eventually. We got over it after, after an hour or two. Um, so then I couldn't travel. So that was the first kind of hiccup with it. Um, and then they had, um, then I came over to the UK that, that summer or like UK summer. Um, and I didn't have time to be able to go because I was playing Middlesex quite a bit. Um, I didn't have time to go to Scotland or like see them or anything. Um, so then they said about September being those qualifiers in the UAE. Uh, and they had like a week, we had a week, um, in Scotland against Ireland in a series. Um, we were supposed to play three games. We played like one and a half because of the rain. So, but that was really cool. Um, but yeah, so some, there's a girl who played at my old club at home, um, Fee Penny. She's played I don't, over a hundred games for Scotland. Um, she obviously retired, but, um, she had like a little, like, I guess note for me that, um, Abby who presented my cat gave me and stuff. And it was, it was a really surreal feeling. Obviously it would have been lovely to have my mum there in particular, my grandma and stuff like that. Um, but I know they, I got plenty of support from back home when, when I kind of got back to my phone and stuff, which is really cool. Cause, um, I know how proud my mum was for me to represent her country and stuff. Um, and, and it was just, it, I just think there's a really awesome group there as well. So it's, it was actually a really exciting opportunity and, I look forward to whenever I can next play with them. It's just a bit, they're on the other side of the world for me. So it's very difficult travel wise and organizing things, but um, hopefully there's more opportunities in the future. Um, and I would love to qualify Scotland for a World Cup. I just think that would be, even if we got smashed every game, it wouldn't even matter. Like just to make, I just know how cool that would be. Um, it's kind of one of my life goals to be fair, as far as cricket life goals uh, is concerned. Yeah, I mean, that's the natural next step for them. And I guess you look at what Ireland are achieving in Correct. as well. And that, that's the model to follow, I, I think, isn't it, in development? Of 100%. The game there. And I guess, you know, Australia and Scotland have got so much in common in that you know, they're two nations, I think, who hate the English the most. So, it... Correct. <laughs> <laughs> it just seems natural for me then. It just seems natural. <laughs> Playing with Sunrisers in a couple of weeks. Of course, you already know yeah. Abtar from Scotland and a couple of the other yes. guys played at Middlesex. Kind of what are your, I suppose, hopes or thoughts going into into the Rachel Hayer Flint Trophy? Yeah, I'm excited because um, I was saying this to Andy Tennant, the coach, um, when I was at the training the other, um, the other day. And I was just saying I'm excited to see the way their professional environment works because for me, obviously, I've only ever experienced a professional environment with New South Wales, um, which is a pretty good one. So it would just be really cool to see how how different he is. I only met him briefly when I was in Scotland, he was only there for the week against Ireland. So I, and he wasn't head coach. So he was kind of just in and around. I met him, but didn't actually know his coaching style and stuff. But um, I mean, the way that they've done in the, that preseason tour at Desert Springs to win three from three against the stars and diamonds is, is really promising. And it shows that there's a lot of talent there. And I hope that, hope that I can add to that um, and perform the way I would like to perform as well. Um, but I guess the aim there is to get their to get their first win. That'd be massive. If we get one win, we've ticked a box for them, certainly. Um, and it would just be really cool. So yeah, I'm really excited to to train with the group. I've obviously met I met all the girls the other day, but to actually I think train with them um and then play with them would be really cool. We talked to Kelly Castle about this, haven't we? About this. oh yeah, Kelly. There's going to be some sort of uh, sunrises the movie if if you finally win a game and then and then go and get to a final and win the final. I, I can just see it's the stuff of Hollywood. Yes, it is, and but I think there's, I mean, you never say never, never say never. Who knows? Um, I think there's a lot of talent in that in that group. Um, that I think they showed glimpses of it last year, and they were in games. It's just about them finishing off games. Um, so I definitely think there's potential there. I don't think other teams are super, super far ahead. It's more just about how can they put together a whole game. Um, and maybe Andy might be able to bring that out of them for obviously I'm only there for five games, but as a whole thing. And then with Dane coming over, that's gonna add some experience and a bit of firepower as well. So a bit of anger and stuff like that, which is cool. Cause I added a bit of anger as well, because I'm competitive. So <laughs> might work. Might work. Hopefully it does. But yeah, Kel played at Manly with me at my and my club team. So I met her kind of fully then. I kind of knew of her, but it was really cool to wear a bit of a bromance in 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 Oz. In Oz so um, that was good fun. 
Yeah, no, Sun- Sunrise was an exciting team because, I mean, we were so shocked when we saw in Desert Springs that they got three wins. We were like, what? Like, this is mad. And to think that's the team, you know, without Danny Van Neerkirk and, you know, without yourself. Um, so it is it is really exciting because I think Grace Scrivens, um, for us, is an exciting player. Like, I can't wait to see her play for the England senior side. She was amazing at the Under-19 World Cup. Um, but yeah, they've got quite a lot of experience, but then also some really young players coming through. So I think it is quite a good mix and hopefully, hopefully we'll see a win. Yeah, be good. Be good to good to get a, we've got a few more practice games coming up, which will be really good because I joined the group next week, about midweek next week, just because I'm, then I finally get my, my rest, my rest days are done by then. Um, but yeah, it'll be cool. Be cool to get around the group. So far in like your time over in, in the in the northern hemisphere, what have been your like favorite places you've visited or favorite things you've seen? I think last year massive highlight was playing at Lords. So I was really fortunate that in my first week I got to play at Lords. So something I'll hold on forever. Um, obviously Middlesex is based at Lords, so we had our press day and things like that at Lords. But I think to play on there in my first week, um, yeah, Carrie Carswell just messaged me and was like, "Hey, do you want to play at Lords?" And I was like. Uh, yes. Um, so I played for the MCC there. So that was really cool. Um, an re- awesome opportunity, obviously traveling a little bit around um, around Europe and stuff like that to Wales and um, to France was really cool. Um, I'd love to travel a bit more, um, obviously outside of cricket season and stuff like that. But um, we played at the Oval as well last year against Surrey. So they're, they're probably the two cricket locations that I've been to that have been the most prestigious, I guess. But yeah. Um, but no, still lots to explore. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's absolutely brilliant. I think being in Lon- London as well, London's just such an exciting city to mm. be. There's just so much going on. And the, and there's always, I think that wherever you're from, your group of people are always existing somewhere in London as well. <laughs> always, yeah. You know, I think it's just such a brilliant place to be, particularly as, you know, a, a young person, just to be in the city and, and living your life there and exploring it. Yeah, it's much busier than Sydney. That's the one thing that it is. It's much, much busier. There's a lot more people, which I didn't think was really that much possible, but there is a lot of people. So that's probably the biggest thing, the biggest kind of shock to everything is that there's just people on the roads everywhere, every moment of the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're based in Birmingham, so we're we're out. So, so Birmingham's the second city in, in Britain. Yeah, but right. It's, but it's so nowhere near like London at busy. all. You know, London's yeah. like a different place altogether. Yeah. In fact, we're we're nipping down tomorrow, aren't we? Mm. We're 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 looking to go to Wembley tomorrow to watch uh, uh, the Lionesses, England women play against Brazil at soccer. So, oh yeah, yeah. I'm going to the Aussies first England next uh, week. Uh, oh, Brentford. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Brentford. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we'll see. How it, it should be good. It should be good fun because my uh, my partner is English, so we're both going. So that's going to be fun to say that the Aussies won and the Aussies are better. Otherwise, I'll be very quiet on the way home. I reckon. Yeah, I think I think you might end up being quite quiet on the way home. We'll see. We'll yeah, see. Probably. Time will tell. Time will tell. Sam Kerr. We'll see. <laughs> very true. Saskia, it's been brilliant to talk to you. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, I want to wish you well for this season with Sunrisers. I hope. You hit the winning runs for them in in your first game. Hopefully, oh. hopefully I score. Hopefully I score some runs. Or to be fair, just get a win somehow. It doesn't yeah. matter even if it's not me getting it. Just to get a win and actually and be happy with our performances would be the biggest thing. So, uh, no, thank you very much for for reaching out and yeah, look forward to chatting soon. Well, that was great. It was really good to talk to her, wasn't it? And uh, mm-hmm. I think she's going to have a really good year this year. No, that would be really good. I mean, she's only playing five games for Sunrisers, but um, yeah, she played for Middlesex last year. So it'll be interesting to see um, what she can do over here. Mm, and for Scotland as well. Yeah, for Scotland. Um, I think that's all we need to speak about this week. We'll be back next week with another guest. Yeah, we've got quite a few guests lined up. Um In fact, next week, we've got a guest from one of our other favourite places. We have, yes. In fact, next week, we can announce a a special exclusive sponsorship deal. Do you know what? If they did sponsor us, I would be a very happy person. So next next week's programme, we're going to be putting in adverts for our new sponsor <laughs> throughout. You know, on these podcasts where they, they have to break off and do ads yeah. in the middle of it. 
I think we need to yeah. be doing that next next week. Well, we we better contact them see if they want to sponsor us. <laughs> no, 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 no. They have no choice. We'll just announce it. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, in the meantime, you can follow us on social media. So our Instagram is Naughty Child Podcast and our Twitter is A Red Child Podcast.